Good day to everybody. I'm happy to be here and uh, share with you uh, this uh, session dedicated on developing a toolbox to manage complex calcified lesions. This session is sponsored by Asahi Company and Shockway Company. Asahi is uh, one of the leaders uh, in the world uh, on wires. And uh, I believe that uh, Asahi is giving us uh, the best wires uh, to cross every type of lesion, and especially calcified lesion. And uh, Shockwave uh, is uh, promoting a new uh, revolutionary device able uh, to break calcium, to change the stiffness of calcium, leading to a better treatment of these calcified lesions. And uh, I want to start uh, in trying to share with you uh, what are the problems that we face every day with calcium. Uh, where is uh, calcium in our body? I want to propose uh, you uh, as first uh, this paper uh, regarding the calcium in aortic valve. Aortic sclerosis is common in the elderly and is associated with an increase of approximately 50% in the risk of death from cardiovascular causes and the risk of myocardial infarction even in the absence of a hemodynamically significant obstruction of the left ventricular outflow, only to have calcification in the leaflets of the aortic valves means to die 50% more. Mitral valve calcification, as you can see, this uh, typical X-ray with the calcified annulus of the mitral valve. Mitral valve calcification in the elderly and in patients with the suspected coronary artery disease are associated with an increase in cardiovascular death. What about coronary arteries? We have a lot of paper regarding the coronary calcification. I propose you only this two paper. The presence and extent of coronary calcifications are strong and independent prognostic markers of future cardiovascular disease and mortality. What about carotid artery? Calcified carotid plaques may predict major adverse cardiovascular events in type 2 diabetes and in the elderly. This is particularly true in type 2 diabetes with a low degree of stenosis independently from the hemodynamic effect of calcium in aortic valve, mitral valve, carotids. We have an increase in death and major cardiovascular events. Thoracic aorta. Thoracic aorta calcification is associated with an increased risk of death and cardiovascular disease. Observe how it's different to have some calcium in the X-ray of thoracic aorta or to have not this calcium regarding the death rate of the patient. What about abdominal aorta? This is a part of the Framingham studies. More than uh, 1,000 men and 1,400 women, 22 years of follow-up, and uh, uh, abdominal aortic calcification deposits detected by lateral lumbar radiograms are a marker of subclinical atherosclerotic disease and an independent predictor of subsequent vascular morbidity and mortality. What about peripheral arteries? Lower extremity arterial calcification are associated with disease severity and outcomes, including amputation, and all cause mortality. In peripheral artery disease patients, the tibial artery calcification score is associated with the stage of disease and it identifies those who are at high risk for amputation better than traditional risk factors and an abnormal ABI. What about the type of calcification? Essentially, in the vascular system, we have two types of calcification. The first one affects the big elastic arteries and is typically associated expression of the evolution of atherosclerosis and is called intimal arterial calcification. The second one prefers the muscular, muscular arteries and uh, is uh, localized in the media. So it is called medial artery calcification and in the past, Monkeberg sclerosis. What I want uh, to show you 
is that uh, in this study recently published on Jack, both this type of calcification can evolve in, in oxification, bone formation inside the arteries. So we have, we have a osteoblasts, osteoclasts, proteins typical of bones inside our arteries, a bonification of the arterial tree. London, a nephrologist, in this paper wanted to analyze the difference in the prognosis of medial artery calcification and intimal artery calcification. He was focused on medial artery calcification. And so he wrote that arterial medial calcification is a strong prognostic marker of full cause mortality in hemodialysis patients independently of classical atherogenic factors. But uh, if you see the curves of survival, you can see that uh, to have intimal arterial calcification is worse than to have medial arterial calcification. And uh, I want to finish with the paper by Fanelli who has demonstrated that calcium represents a barrier to optimal drug absorption. Circumferential distribution seems to be the most influencing factor with the worst effect noticed in 360 degrees calcium presence. We made a meta-analysis regarding infrapopletal MAC of 15 studies, and we found that MAC is associated with major and minor lower limb amputations, suggesting MAC as a possible new marker of the at-risk limb. And yesterday, in my presentation, I showed our paper and the paper of the Friends of San Francisco, and uh, uh, all this data suggest that uh, the pedal arterial calcification score or its reflection of global microvascular disease burden could limit revascularization efficacy in patients with the CLTI. So, looking at this patient, you can see the annulus, mitral annulus calcified, coronary al calcified, aortic vat is calcified, carotids, all the aortics calcified, iliac arteries are calcified. A little bit less of the common femoral arteries but uh, the superficial femoral arteries are totally calcified. So according to all this paper, and these are only very few papers talking about calcium, we know that uh, this man is a dead walking man because the fate of this man is uh, a tragedy. And when we treat this man, we will face a lot of problems. So in conclusion, calcium Wherever it is, heart valves, coronary carotid, aorta, peripheral arteries, and of any kind, intimal or medial, is associated with death, major amputation, and procedure failure. Calcium is our worst enemy. And, uh, and I am very happy to be here with this great sponsor to share these problems with you. And uh, we start with the first pre-recorded talk, Guide wire technology, navigate your way through calcified lesions by Coin de Luz. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you something about guide wire technology during this uh, lunch symposium uh, navigate your way through calcified lesions. These are my disclosures. So actually, there are three types of uh, uh, cases. First of all, you have the frontline cases, the very easy, straightforward lesions, stenosis, fresh thrombus. So you absolutely want to stay intraluminally and you want to avoid dissections. That's a clear indication for the use of sliding wires. Um, second point, the more complex cases. Then you have uh, uh, CTO cases, long CTO cases with different levels of uh, calcium when it is still uh, doable to stay intraluminal where we try to penetrate the proximal cap following the micro channels and deliver all our devices we need to use penetrating drilling or cto wires in some cases we really need to let's say bypass the tremendous amount of uh, calcium and fibrotic tissue and we go subintimally in this way 
um, and in this uh, for this task we need dissecting wire. So let's give an overview of these three different types of wire. First of all, in the frontline cases, the sliding wires, I think the Gladius family, as I call it, um, is actually very appropriate for this job. First of all, sliding. Sliding means we need a, a gel-like, a smooth, lubricious surface of the guide wire in order to track and to slide through tortuous vessels and uh, calcified vessels. We need to try to find the micro channels and in this way reducing um, the, the friction in the channels and finding the way of the lowest resistance. The polymeric jacket um, uh, that is, let's say, surrounding these uh, gladius wires are perfectly uh, placed for doing this job, of course, in combination with uh, a hydrophilic coating of uh, the wire. Also very important in the Gladius family is, of course, the round core. I like a round core rather than the typical flat core. Uh, with a flat core, you have this whip motion when you are torquing uh, your wire. You see that all at once the wire takes a 100 degrees um, without any control. Uh, here with the round core, there is no whip motion and you have a perfect uh, uh, torque response. Very important also in this category of stainless steel wires is the ACT-1 uh, uh, technology where um, because of this dedicated um, structure that you can follow there on the movie, um, your wire, stainless steel wire, is extremely protected, is durable, not in the same way as nitinol uh, wires, but very close. It protects the core from kinking and fracturing, and it increases also the torque force. Last but not least, in the Gladius family, we see also that the support is increasing step by step. The red curve, if you compare it with the competitors, where you see this acute increase of support and then a flat level, here you see that the Gladius family wires is really, um, let's say, increasing the support and the rigidity of the wire step by step. And in this way, we can avoid prolapses in collaterals and whatever. Above the knee, Gladius 018, like I've mentioned, the tip load of four grams. So it's not a CTO wire, but foreseen hydrophilic coating over 10 centimeter, polymeric jacket, act one uh, uh, technology, creating a lot of support, a lot of lubricity, and a very good torquing uh, uh, capacity. For below the knee, we have the Asahi Gladius 014, a little bit longer, hydrophilic uh, coated, 50 centimeter, and um, a polymeric jacket of 40 centimeters. Also, three gram tip load, so quite low, um, with Act 1 technology. Here are some cases above the knee, you see that with a competitor wire, it was impossible to pass this high-grade instant re-stenotic lesion. And with a Gladius 018, you will see how easy we are sliding, uh, thanks to the uh, polymeric jacket, sliding through and through the lesion um, in order to um, uh, recanalize it in a smooth way. Here, the same uh, a case below the knee, where there was a long occlusion of the posterior tibule with an outflow in the lateral plantar arch by sliding with an Asagi Gladius 14 step by step it was possible uh, to recanalize the entire posterior tibule. When we are talking about below the knee vessels and especially below the ankle vessels um, I need to talk about the regalia wire of Asagi, a very special uh, sliding wire with only a tip load of one gram but a one-piece core wire, so a perfect tactile feedback you have at the tip uh, of your wire, sliding with the polymeric jacket very easily uh, through the below the ankle uh, vessels, perfectly for navigating into the pedal arch, into metatarsal arteries, for a delicate retrograde access, in my opinion, uh, the ultimate wire for this job. Then, of course, we switch to the more penetrating drilling and CTO wires. 
in more complex or longer CTOs with different level of calcium. And there uh, we can apply the Halbert family. The Halbert family also with the same technology as in the Gladius, a round core, the ACT1 technology. Um, but we miss, we skip the polymeric jacket. There is no goal of sliding anymore. We still have the hydrophilic uh, coating. We have extremely important a microcone tip. So, and making it microcone or a little bit tapered, uh, it don't need any explanation uh, to, to say to you that this has much more penetration power. Also, the fact that the tip load is higher, the combination of both of this makes it really a penetrating or drilling CTO wire. And last but not least, also very important, the coating, the hydrophilic coating, is not running all the way up to the uh, tip. The tip is uncoated, uh, uh, pure stainless steel. And so the tactile feedback that we have from the tip is uh, much better than with the polymeric jacket. Uh, it offers you also much more uh, support. So the Halbert 018 for above the knee lesions, a tip load of 12 gram, as you can notice, the microcone tip, the hydrophilic coating, but not with the tip included. So an uncoated ball tip, Act 1 technology offers you all these characteristics. And the same, by the way, for the Asahi Halbert 014 for the below the knee work, where we still have the 12 gram tip load. Here a case with an occlusion at the level of a hunter's canal, and you see by fast spinning drilling technique with a torquer device, it is easy to drill through and through this um, tight occlusion, fibrotic occlusion at, the, at this level in an intraluminal way. Here another case, uh, a, a case of uh, Roberto, our uh, moderator, where we noticed that it was quite easy to recanalize a very uh, fibrotic lesion in the anterior tibial with a nice result afterwards. And then, of course, uh, uh, as an ultimate CTO penetrating wire, I need to look at the Astato family, where we have no polymeric jacket anymore, where we still have a hydrophilic coating, an uncoated tip, and also extremely important look at this tapering of the tip, so it really makes it like a, a sword to penetrate through and through the lesion. And of course, the tip loads are uh, in the same area. Um, as you can notice, uh, we are talking about an Astato uh, 20. You see a tip load of 30 gram. And if we are talking about an Astato 40, we are talking about 40 gram. Um, in above the knee, the Astato 30 with a tip, growth of, tip load of 30 gram is for me a perfect wire to tackle uh, calcified occlusions. And in the below the knee, the Astata 20 and 40, also with a one-piece core wire to have a maximal penetration power and a perfect uh, tactile feedback, what you are doing uh, is important uh, to use these wires as CTO wires. Here you see a uh, very calcified SFA occlusion. So with the Astato 30, we were able um, uh, to drill, to penetrate through and through the occlusion, as you can see over there. From the moment on, I see that there is the trend towards making a, 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 a loop, as you can see over here. I keep, I don't make a loop. I keep drilling, drilling and spinning. And you see that in this way, um, the high tip load of 30 gram is really uh, um, valuable in order to pass this extreme calcium. Afterwards, we treat this with a nice drug-coated balloon, and the result is outstanding. The same, again, a case of uh, Roberto, where he was able to pass with an Astato 20, uh, a very calcified lesion transition zone, uh, dorsalis pedis anterior tibial artery, um, and you see how tight it is because also high pressure balloons have problems uh, to open this kind of lesion, but finally with this nice result at the end. And then finally, uh, we can focus when we are not able to pass intraluminally on a subintimal recanalization. At this way, in this uh, situation, we need another type of wires where we see that the distal core is modified with a micro gap. So an acute 
uh, increase from extremely flexible five to seven millimeter tip towards in a couple of millimeters, very fast increasing to a rigid wire. So that makes it this micro gap makes it possible to create a narrow loop at the tip and to create um, a perfect wire for dissection. Here you see uh, for in purple, this uh, first very smooth, flexible, short tip. And then after a couple of millimeters, the high increase of uh, rigidity. So creating um, a, a perfect strong push force uh, that is necessary for the delivery of devices. Here we have the Gladius MG14 uh, uh, extra support. It is not a CTO wire, so a low tip load of three gram. The ACT-1 technology is available. The polymeric jacket is uh, uh, present, uh, but of course the very acute tapering with the micro gap for narrow, narrow looping is extremely important. An example case, where we try to recanalize in a retrograde way the anterior tubule using a transcollateral approach from the peroneal artery and making this little uh, narrow loop, as you can see over there with the Gladius MG14 extra support, makes it feasible to recanalize uh, this through a transcollateral uh, approach. So I can conclude that, uh, in my opinion, the guide wire algorithm to use is based on the lesions. If we are talking about sliding, easy, straightforward lesions, you use a wire of the Gladius family in the O14 or the O18, depending on the anatomical area. Uh, when we are uh, tackling more calcified fibrotic tissue, uh, we need to use the Halbert family first, and in extreme situations, the Astato, 20, 30, or 40 gram tip load. And then of course, last but not least, if we want to use uh, the narrow loop technique for a supintimal recanalization, we use the Gladius MG14 extra support. And with this armamentarium, you can cover more than 95% of the uh, uh, clinical situations that you want to tackle in infra-inguinal disease. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Cohen. As always, uh, a, a great presentation. A great presentation. Uh, then uh, we will connect with uh, Konstantinos Stavroulakis, who will talk uh, about uh, the uh, lithotripsy, intravascular lithotripsy, breaking down, breaking down the complexity of several severely calcified lesions. Konstantinos. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the kind invitation. I'm happy to be uh, here, at least uh, online. Uh, hopefully, we'll meet again in Lugan next year. So um, I think both of you nicely presented the challenges that are raised from calcified disease. It's difficult to cross, difficult to treat. And even when we achieve uh, great acute results, it's very difficult to keep uh, the, pa the vessel patent, uh, meaning that uh, w uh, w even if we place a scaffold, uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, keep the, uh, the, treat pa um, uh, the treat vessel patent in the long run. Uh, of course, we have um, high rates of complications, local complications, and we should never forget that these patients, like Roberto said, are high-risk uh, patients, uh, both for mortality and morbidity. Uh, most of the times are patients with diabetes or chronic kidney disease. In this context, we have to uh, find a solution to treat calcium effectively in order to uh, keep the vessel patent, but at the same time safe, uh, so that this patient will not suffer any uh, complication that can be uh, fatal uh, for them. Um, and when, especially when we talk about uh, SFA and POP disease, the unique anatomical environment of uh, the largest or the longest vessels uh, on the body uh, are also a challenge. We see that there is no stent that cannot uh, suffer fracture, even modern stents like the supera can, uh, uh, can fracture the pleural artery, and we have a uh, shortening, twisting, and bending on the same time in this vessel, which really challenges the performance of almost every endovascular modality. Uh, when we go for a plain noble angioplasty for very calcified lesions, of course, uh, we might acute some uh, acute uh, angio, angio, uh, good angiographic results, but well, 
what we know is that the non-compliance of the vessel leads to an overstress in the non-disease uh, segment of the vessel, which leads afterwards to a recoil and the uh, risk stenosis uh, either in the long run or also uh, on the, in an acute setting. Um, there are some uh, devices available in the market the last uh, years. I think the last uh, 20 years we saw an endovascular uh, um, a boom of, an, uh, of devices for the treatment of calcium, uh, specialty balloons, atherectomy catheters, and, and so on. But the problem is that these procedures are most of the time time consuming. Uh, we need uh, repeated angiograms uh, and meaning uh, also uh, contrast agent, uh, which uh, might be harmful, especially for uh, chronic kidney disease patients. Uh, and uh, these modalities mainly target uh, the intimal calcium with no effect on the medial calcification. Uh, the shockwave system was introduced some years ago, and I think that is a, a, one of the most important uh, uh, innovations in the treatment of PAD. Uh, and it's a simple uh, system to use. It consists of three elements, the generator, uh, the connector cable, uh, which uh, then uh, is connected to the disposable IVL catheter. The catheter is compatible with O14 guide wire uh, of your choice. Uh, there is no uh, specific, su specific suggestion. Uh, most of the times I use a wire that provides me support because when you walk uh, with an O14 guide wire um, and the shockwave catheter, you will need some support uh, to deliver the device. Uh, it's not a low profile device. That's why I suggest you to use a catheter that uh, can help you deliver uh, the, the, uh, the catheter and, has, and uh, offers a kind of support. Uh, the lithotripsy is based on the well-known uh, um, technology of the uh, kidney stone treatment. And what is uh, very important is that the catheter is hard on hard. Uh, when we have, uh, it's effective on heart tissue and calcified disease, but doesn't have any uh, real effect. The sonic pressure waves do not have any real effect on soft uh, tissue. Um, it's very easy uh, to use. There is, indeed, there, there are no uh, special skills needed uh, for the use of the catheter. There are some uh, things that you have to keep in mind. First of all, that the optimal uh, technique requires an oversizing of the catheter, uh, at least uh, 0.5, uh, and you have to overlap the catheter because the proximal and distal uh, market do not uh, produce any uh, shock waves. So if you have to overlap the catheter, please uh, do it at least one centimeter. Otherwise, we will have a geographical mismatch. Uh, the latest dat data from the DISRAP uh, PAD trial, which evaluate the, the safety and the efficacy of the balloon compared to uh, plain old balloon angioplasty uh, prior to DCB, so that uh, we have an uh, increased procedural success uh, compared to uh, PTA, both on site reported and uh, core lab uh, adjudicated uh, data. And most importantly, uh, the risk, and especially the risk for um, a flow limiting dissection is uh, significantly lower when we prepare the vessel uh, with uh, IVL uh, prior to drug coated balloon angioplasty. Uh, except the data from the randomized trial, we have also the data published uh, at Viva uh, one week ago uh, from the observational registry. Here we talk about real world data, uh, patients that are not uh, selected. And we see that in the first analysis of seven, more than 750 patients and uh, 852 lesions, we, um, uh, we, uh, the, the IVL catheter was used in a variety of lesions from the iliacs up to BTK. And in this registry, not, almost 90% of the lesions were uh, severely calcified. When we see the uh, 30 days results, um, it's, imp it's very impressive that the uh, treatment with IVL showed very promising uh, performance in all vascular beds from the iliac up to uh, BTK disease with low rates of perforation or distal embolization. And this is very important because as I said before, it's not only important to have an effective treatment, but also a safe uh, treatment. In this case, the low rates of periprocedural complication is very, very important for this uh, very fragile uh, subgroup of patients. And uh, it's not only that the IVL performed well in uh, simple in uh, lesions, but also in the complex lesions and CLTI patients. We see here that uh, the performance of the catheter was uh, very promising in uh, lesions longer than 50 centimeters, in eccentric lesions, in CTOs, uh, severe calcium and CLI. I will focus on the eccentric lesions because uh, many people are skeptic about the performance of the catheter uh, in eccentric uh, lesions. As you see in this uh, data, we have very good luminal gain 
also in uh, eccentric uh, disease. And uh, I would like to show you a case uh, which summarized the, the challenges that we face from calcium. As you see here, a patient uh, pre uh, previously treated with common femoral dactyrectum on the right side uh, presents with a CLTI uh, with, a, uh, with, a, uh, with a pain and rest. Uh, went from uh, uh, from the contralateral groin up and over, uh, performed an angiogram, as you see, you have a good uh, runoff, uh, two vessel runoff from the anterior tibial and the peroneal, uh, but a very uh, heavily calcified uh, SFA and the uh, pleural artery disease. Um, uh, we uh, went from the contralateral, for a contralateral approach because the the, the groin was previously operated. And as you see here, I'm using the Navicross catheter, the O18, uh, and the Gladius MG uh, catheter in, uh, to cross the lesion. I used in this uh, case the O14 guide wire. And as you see, I'm struggling to go to come through this uh, heavily calcified uh, disease. I was able to, uh, after uh, many attempts, was able to cross uh, with the O14 guide wire, but afterwards I couldn't even uh, advance the O18 uh, Navi. Uh, that's why I predilated uh, the lesion with a uh, low profile uh, PTA catheter uh, just to uh, create a channel. Um, and then uh, again, uh, the, whole, the entire lesion will be predilated. Uh, when I uh, use a shockwave catheter and have this kind of uh, tight stenosis, I always predilate because it's difficult to cross it. As you see here, I was uh, I want to go for an IVUS guided procedure, but uh, despite the predilation with a low profile catheter, I couldn't advance the uh, the rapid exchanger uh, O14 uh, IVUS uh, predilate. Try it again, and as you see, the IVUS catheter uh, stacks in this lesion, and uh, these are uh, the lesions that really require. Uh, patient, I changed afterwards for the O18 uh, um, uh, IVUS catheter, which is uh, over the wire, and uh, performed this IVUS run. Um, as you can appreciate, in this uh, IVUS run, we have uh, subtotal occlusions, and uh, um, in uh, in this uh, lesion, uh, heavily calcified intima, and uh, almost uh, occluded the segments of the vessel. Um, and when I when I did the, the first angiogram, I thought that it would be easy to treat because the vessel wasn't occluded. Uh, but after struggling so much to uh, uh, to um, deliver the catheters, I was uh, really skeptical of what I'm going to do. Uh, as you see here, despite the predilation, I couldn't advance the shockwave catheter uh, deeper, uh, and then I had to uh, predilate again with an angioscalp catheter. I was even thinking about going for a Pierce maneuver, but at the end. After this uh, angioscalp uh, uh, predilation, I was able to uh, treat uh, to deliver the uh, shockwave catheter. This is the M5 plus. Uh, it has the advantage uh, that is uh, it has a longer shaft, it's 135, and to deliver the pulses even more uh, fast than the usual catheter. And uh, uh, as you see here, we all after the shockwave um, uh, treatment, we have a pulsatile flow to the distal pulmonary artery. This is always a good sign. Uh, and uh, I have some kind of recoil, but um, I'm, I was very happy with the result because we have a sufficient luminal gain without any um, IVUS uh, observed uh, dissections. And it's also very important to keep in mind that when you treat this kind of calcified disease, when you don't go for IVUS guided procedure, it's, the, the angiogram may fail and the angiogram um, might not reveal this uh, a significant dissection you may lose. So after uh, going for uh, the, uh, the for um, after uh, shockwave uh, angioplasty, I went for drug coat balloon angioplasty based on my IVUS result. I saw that I have very good luminal gain for the uh, uh, majority of the lesion and uh, I placed just a, a short uh, uh, six by forty stent uh, in this um, distal part of the lesion, which didn't really respond uh, very, very well to the shockwave catheter. Otherwise, we have an exceptional uh, luminal gain, post dilated with the Mustang catheter uh, from uh, Boston, and then uh, the completion IVUS, where we see uh, the good stent expansion and the uh, excellent luminal gain from the shockwave catheter. Keep in mind that it was a patient that we couldn't even advance uh, the, uh, the catheters, we couldn't even uh, uh, advanced the, and the support catheter. So uh, with this uh, uh, IVUS run and the uh, angiogram that we'll show you afterwards, uh, I think that the result was exceptional and we used just a short 
as 6 by 40 as 10 in this very demand inflation. Um, additionally, as you, as you can appreciate, uh, without the use of, use of digital protection device, uh, the runoff uh, stayed open. Um, and this is also a very big advantage that because of the low risk for embolization, we don't really need a digital protection device. To conclude, uh, the shockwave system is a simple uh, system to use based on the established principles of lithotripsy. Uh, we have broad applications across different uh, vascular beds from the iliacs up to BTK. Uh, till now, uh, the short-term results that are available show a very good performance across uh, different lesion types. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, the data show that we have uh, a very uh, good safety profile, which is very important in this uh, uh, frail uh, subgroup of patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Constantinos. A great talk. Then we move to Lorenzo Patron again, that will talk about making the right choice at the right time for the best result. Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberto. It's a quite a challenging title because, I mean, uh, who, who wouldn't like to take, you know, to make the right choice at the right time for the best results? So I will try to, uh, to explain to you how we can maybe do it. Uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, we all know that the CLTI or anyway, vascular problems are a big family. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, every, every disease is different. And we need to understand that there are different uh, kind of uh, uh, lesions, like also Kuhn said, there are stenosis, there are occlusions. There are some lesions which are more acute and some which are more chronic. So now all this is quite confusing. We need to be ready to act to any kind of uh, scenario. And uh, for example, let's take this uh, very uh, short, uh, actually very calcified lesion. And we can debate, you know, between us, which wire would be best, the 025, 018, 014. And actually, I think that many people would say that I'm right. I know because I've done it many. And I personally think that the lesions like this should be uh, treated with uh, very soft wires, 014, 018, in order to be able to be gentle, not to dissect, because in case you dissect, then the treatment could be uh, more difficult in order to uh, cross again into the lumen, for example. Uh, but what we want to talk is not about stenosis, it's mainly about about chronic total occlusions. These are the most challenging lesions. And let's try to see, for example, this uh, long SFA popliteal lesion. So essentially it was a, just a little stump after the bypass. This was not the popliteal artery because you can see that the, this is just a, a branch for the calf. And the only thing that you can see here, which is recanalizing the vessel distally, is this small anterior tibial artery. So because of the previous surgery, we were not able to uh, um, access uh, the proximal cap. We decided to go with the, with the um, retrograde access the level of the anterior tibial artery, and this is what's done. And you can see that I tried with the wire to uh, go towards the popliteal, but the only thing which I did, I was going to a collateral. So once you have this collateral there, you have a very sharp angle. It's very, very difficult to get into the popliteal. So what I did, I tried you know, uh, to take out uh, the rabbit from uh, my hat, and I took this as I held it. You can see how the micro knuckle of uh, the tip of the wire is able to engage the occluded popliteal. You can see how I'm drilling, and it was very nice that Kuhn showed this, uh, this video where he was drilling. I'm doing the same. I don't push. I don't want to make the loop. I always need to drill. And by drilling, you can see how my wire goes in, even in collaterals, which is nice, because that means that I'm intraluminal. And I try slowly, very slowly, to move up. You see, I don't push. I just try to follow the path, which uh, the micro channels, which uh, are uh, within the calcium. You can see how my wire goes up and up. You know, I just want to show you this video, because this is like a bit of more, again, as Kuhn said, it's a bit of a difficulty. I wanted to try to inject into the lumen to see if there was any uh, uh, space, ex extravascular uh, um, um, expansion of contrast. You can see how this wire then doesn't advance anymore. So I switch then because I don't want to perforate the vessel, such a precious access to an Asahi Gladius MG18 PVAS, which is a long name, but it's a very effective wire. You can see how it uh, kinks and it makes a little loop. And in the last, last bit, it, uh, it was done subintimal in order to re-enter straight away. And actually, I, you know, I was very happy. And then I treated and it worked very well with a bit of standing. But when we talk about treatment, we need to think about that the first uh, uh, percutaneous limb salvage procedure with a balloon angioplasty was done by a cardiologist is from Zurich. Uh, in 1974. So, you know, uh, uh, Grunzik invented the balloon and treated, but till now, 
you know, we don't have very much more than angioplasty. So this is why I want to try to explore other ways. If you look at this uh, uh, video, which is a uh, courtesy of Medtronic, you can see how this uh, balloon is inflated in a, in a tube, a silicon tube with some crosses. You see, as, uh, um, as soon as you inflate the balloon, uh, you see how the crosses change in uh, angulation. That means the vessel, and the tube in this case, but the vessel, generally speaking, is... Uh, is stressed by this kind of torsion. And you can see here again, another from Metronic, you can see again the balloon which opens and the inflation of conventional balloons cause stress to the, uh, to the vessel trauma. So essentially, especially if you go to high pressure, you can see how the balloon becomes almost a sausage. So as James Dean said, only the gentle are ever really strong. And actually, I want to show you the shockwave. It's actually gentle, but strong at the same time. So the liver catheter, you inflate at the low pressure. We've seen from Constantinos, like the first inflation is very low pressure, just for the catheter, for the different, uh, um, you know, little markers to touch the calcium, to touch the vessel, then you generate this wave. And after you crack, crack calcium, then you can safely expand the vessel to nominal diameter. That means that, you know, the calcium, which is seen uh, pre-IVLI treatment in this cadaveric uh, sample like this, then it becomes completely different. You can see all the arrows which are showing the cracks into the uh, calcium of the artery. So just to give you an example, this is a, a very tight stenosis of the TP trunk, very tight. I mean, let's say moderate to severe, but it's very important for this patient. I will show you at the end. So this was crossed and just angioplasty with a, a, a 2.5 millimeter balloon just in order to open the, the vessel. You can see how much calcium does. It looks like someone has painted it, and you can see the five millimeter shockwave. Don't be shy about the size of the shockwave. This was definitely a four millimeter uh, uh, and plus uh, vessel, you can see. And use the five, and you can see how the balloon expands step by step, cracking the calcium in a very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, delicate way. You can see how now that the four millimeter balloon, which I use in this tippy trunk, is fully inflated, and the result is just great. Uh, when we want to uh, put things together, it's important to uh, show a case where, you know, the technology of the wires and the shockwave can make a good combination. I'm very happy that today this webinar is supported by the two companies which are working together to achieve the best results of the patients. You can see here, there's a calcified uh, distal SFA occlusion. You can see the calcium on the screen. And uh, this, you know, the runoff actually is not that bad. So there's a three vessel runoff uh, down, two vessel runoff at least to the foot. You can see here this anjo, like I tried, we tried to uh, cross from undergrade access. We couldn't do, we could, uh, we went subintimal and we didn't want to push too much with our O18 wire because I mean, there was so much calcium, we, don't, we didn't want to push uh, through and then dissect even more. Of course, the, the, the outback and the re-entry device could have been an option, but we decided also to puncture the TP trunk in this case. So I put the TP trunk in between the two bones. We puncture the bone here. You can see the spider patient is moving a little bit. It's very easy to follow. We inserted our CXI catheter over the Azai Gladius, again, MG18PVES. And we reached that point where you can see even the calcium with the patient moving under local anesthesia, we had to cross in some way. And you can see here that my wire is already subintimal here. I didn't push any more from there, but I wanted to keep it as a marker. And you can see now I, I'm trying to engage the plug. You can see again, you know, it, I want to loop it. I, I engage the plug while pushing the catheter into the distal cap in order to have the best uh, support. And then I, st I start with an Astato 30. You can see how I, I'm pushing through and, and I'm, I'm very careful when the wire turns. So essentially at that point, I tried again to get more uh, support by my catheter and try to uh, pave my way towards the, the lumen. You can see that the other wire, remember, is a, is a, a subintimal wire. So it's not uh, into the lumen. And I, I tried then to push a little bit more to break uh, the little cap which was there. And actually I was successful because you can see that my catheter now, it, it, it's in uh, uh, the, the lumen. You can see how my, uh, again, I switch for an Azai Gladius uh, 018, so less aggressive wire in order to um, snare into the catheter and cross uh, uh, the lesion uh, with the wire from through. Of course, I remove my retroid axis, just a little angioplasty with a three millimeter balloon, which I also use to open a little bit the, 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 the track for uh, my uh, shockwave balloon. You can see my shockwave how is at the beginning is so constrained because I don't want to push too much. I just want to make the balloon adhering to the walls 
Of course, then it expands uh, far more, and I go up to the uh, the top of the occlusion. And I want to remember you that you see the balloon is not fully expanded and expands more. I didn't cross the the the, the margin of the occlusion. You can see here after you know uh, even with non-smart mask, how the calcium is evident on the on the screen and the balloon uh, uh, works very well. Then I finish my treatment with a 5.5 millimeter angioplasty because I think that the vessel was more or less that that big. And you can see this is the final result. So the final result after the occlusion, you can see the occlusion is perfectly patent with no uh, uh, dissection apart from this. You see, this is the section where actually the shock wave, did, I did an angioplasty with shock wave. So you can see that in the, in the vessel, which is just below, which was prepared nicely with shock wave, which was totally occluded and more calcific, there's no dissection, the flow is brisk. In the little track just above where I you see the collateral, which I didn't overlap with the shock wave balloon, and the vessel was not that calcific, I got a dissection flap. Of course, it's not a big dissection flap, but just to prove the point that where shock wave passes, the dissection is less likely to happen. Of course, the, the, the uh, runoff was uh, capped. And you can see here that the foot is very well perfused with three vessel runoff. And the absence of distal embolization is something that really uh, uh, we should focus on, you know, both in the observational trial with 757 patients and in the randomized control trial with roughly 150, 0% of embolization. If we compare this rate with the, the uh, competitors, with, for example, the atherectomy devices, you can see that distal embolization still is very much an issue, this reality study. So at uh, the end of my presentation, you have understood hopefully how to cross lesions with our wires, how to, uh, to wire through difficult lesions, but also how to treat very deadly disease in a, in a, in a very effective way. And uh, with that, I hope that you have a good time in Lugano and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lorenzo. Now we move uh, to the last presentation, a pre-recorded presentation by Francesco Liistro. Extreme BTK intervention, optimized crossing and treating. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to present a case at the AMP Europe. And uh, I present you a case uh, of a 78 year old uh, male uh, with diabetes mellitus since 20 years. CL high root for class 5 rest pain with necrosis on the first and the second two. Previous uh, coronary angioplasty. As you can see on the right, there is a phasic flow in the popliteal artery. But in the distal anterotibial artery, there is a really damp flow, as you can observe. So this is the baseline angiography. We have uh, an occlusion of the anterotibial artery, proximal and then a reperfusion in the andorsalis uh, pedis, so long segment of occlusion. In this long uh, CTO, we prefer to, to do a subintimal approach with a loop wire technique, also because there is an ambiguous route that we have to do and we don't make uh, any damage. We go with the loop in subintimal space uh, and we try to keep the subintimal space uh, small not collapsing the true lumen because this is the fear that you must have when you have a big loop on the wire this is the case uh, if you have a, a, a small loop you preserve a tighter subintimal space which allows you a more control for uh, the re-entry at the distality when the vessel get reperfused that's why today i introduce you the asahi gladius mg PV extra support, uh, this is a, a stainless steel wire with a polymer jacket and hydrophilic coating uh, of 10 cm and a coil length of uh, 3 cm and there is also very nice uh, construction of this uh, wire, particularly being a stainless steel wire we have the opportunity to make a bend on this wire and we can easily enter in the anterotibial artery. Otherwise, with other nitinol wires, you cannot make the bend. It may be difficult. You may use uh, two wires, one to go in uh, and the other to do the subintimal uh, revascularization. But with uh, this wire, with the Gladius, uh, of course, we can make uh, the bending. We can go in. And there is also a three, uh, a three gram on, uh, the, on the tip of, uh, of the wire and there is a modified distal core balance which minimizes the tip prolapse so we can keep the loop very small with this uh, wire and there is a very one-to-one -one, uh, torque response to this wire we can also have a torque during the revascularization and subintimal fashion. You can see that the wire goes in directly in the anterotibial artery and uh, we start uh, to loop uh, 35 
the wire goes uh, by himself looping uh, the loop is uh, really really small it goes down and uh, we continue to go down uh, without pushing so much with the balloon you see the balloon is really back and uh, the wire tries to find uh, a way the root of the vessel to to the distality not for us uh, the wire goes uh, very easily down and once we are at the level of the ankle we have to be very careful to go inside the true lumen because we cannot make a dissection of unhealthy segment of the vessel that's why we change direction and in the first attempt the wire doesn't want to slip into the into the true lumen but then we pull back the wire and as you can see the wire finds the way to go in in the in the true lumen once uh, we crossed uh, with a balloon and we can make an injection, we can see that there is uh, the dorsalis pedis uh, giving uh, flow to the arch. Then, uh, as uh, in uh, every case, uh, we do uh, dilatation with 2.5 balloon. We reopen the vessel and we check uh, if we have some perforation. We have, uh, let's say, a flow which is quite good, good lumen, uh, and uh, now we have to decide uh, what to do most. So we did the recanalization, but now we have to optimize our result. And uh, that's why we try to use uh, IDL, intravascular lithotripsy, for uh, peripheral intervention, because there is a, a reduced immediate recoil, allows a complete vessel dilatation, there is no tissue damage, no fear of this embolization of particles, uh, and it's applicable in subintimal fashion, like in intraluminal, uh, and not like uh, atherectomy, rotational, directional. It's applicable also in below the ankle arteries, uh, but uh, in our, let's say, opinion also can give something to a drug code balloon strategy, so it increases the drug penetration into the vessel wall, or may increase the drug storage uh, and the effect. That's why we have this study the bed btk dual that compares uh, sirolimus and paclitaxel uh, in below in the knee intervention but a subgroup of studies that the bed btk shock where we randomize those undergoing a dcb angioplasty to receive prior the dcb the ivl and we'll have a 40 and 40 patients uh, in this uh, uh, um, in this uh, little randomized style of pilot study. That's why this patient belongs uh, to this trial and we do uh, lithoplasty IVL starting from the distal part of the occlusion towards the upper part of the occlusion. All the segments are treated with a 2.5 per 4 centimeter balloon. We apply lithoplasty and after IVL we apply drug coated balloon. This is a paclitaxel coated balloon 3.0 per 300 millimeters and 3.5 per 80 millimeters. And uh, in this way, you can see that this is the final result. We have a very good, uh, very good uh, lumen in the proximal, but also in the mid and uh, in uh, the distality, where there is a quite interesting uh, um, flow in the tissue at the level of the dorsalis uh, pedis. But this, for us, is not enough. Even if the angiography is good, we always check uh, with the duplex at the end of the procedure, and we find that there is a stride flow, phasic flow in the dorsalis pedis and there is also calcified double layer in the distal anterior artery as you can see from, uh, from this curve. So thank you very much. Thank you Francesco. Thank you very much. I think we have some minutes for some questions. There are questions from the audience. I have a question uh, for uh, Cohen. Cora, Cohen, uh, are you still uh, connected? I'm very well connected, Roberto. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so I want to ask you, when you have a very long occlusion, do you try to cross uh, this occlusion uh, with uh, only one wire, or do you change your wire? What is your approach in an endoluminal uh, approach? Yeah, I, I, I always uh, uh, try to start um, from an intraluminal point of view and, and try to stay intraluminal. This is my, my uh, uh, initial goal, actually. Um, why? Because still, um, 
in the supinthermal track, it, it's always a little bit uh, based on, I'm not going to say blind luck, but at least some luck uh, to create your re-entry as uh, close as possible to the real re-entry side. And sometimes you are dissecting a little bit more, a little bit longer than, than you, uh, you are intended. So I try to stay intraluminal, uh, but of course um, it doesn't work all the time. So from the moment on, I tried all my spinning drilling techniques. Um, I use a good halberd with a 12 gram tip load, whatever. And at one moment I stuck, um, I, I stop and I switch, switch to uh, uh, the MG um, and, and switch to the subintimal. So, but plan A for me is intraluminal. When it doesn't work, when I'm completely stuck, I move to plan B, uh, uh, um, subintimal. Thank you. And the second question, between the uh, Gladius MG PV 14 and 18, what is the size of the vessel that you consider treatable with the submittable approach with this type of wire? When you shift from a 35 approach to 18 to 14, according to what? Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, initially, I, 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 I really had in mind um, O18 femoropopliteal, uh, O14 below the knee, below the ankle. But I notice uh, that uh, more and more, um, when I have my O18 at the table, that I continue with this O18 um, um, and femoral popliteal, but also more and more tibial. And I, I, I have even some cases, and, and I believe tomorrow uh, I, I will present one of them, where I go with the O18 uh, platform really up to the foot, uh, to the ankle. I'm not recommending, recommending this uh, all, all the time. But I notice that the more comfortable I am with the O18, the more I use it for all infra-inguinal disease. Thank you. Go can, I, can, I, can I say something? I think that nowadays, I don't know what the panel thinks about, but we switch for SFA and popliteal very much to an O18 approach compared to the old-fashioned O35. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you feel comfortable in making this statement? Because I really feel like... Absolutely. I, I, I made my switch. You know, the old vascular surgical school was only O35. And uh, I switched my mind like five years ago, um, seeing a lot of advantages of the O18 platform. Uh, um, it is more gentle, more soft, less traumatic than an O35 and intraluminal and subintimal. The subintimal O35 loops are extremely big loops. Um, it is also, you work immediately on a lower platform, so you can use lower profile catheters, balloons, uh, to overcome the chronic total occlusion. You know that more and more devices, I'm thinking on Rotarex, I'm thinking on Supera, whatever, Shockwave, are, are also O14, O18 compatible. So, um, yeah, O18 is definitely my choice at this level. Thank you. I think it depends on the kind of lead. So, probably, I, I agree with Kuhn that 80 to 90 percent of the lesions I work with O18, but you know you have a short fibrotic uh, CTO. Sometimes you know the O35 just <laughs> you know recanalize the lesion from uh, on itself. So it de it depends. But uh, to, I agree to 89 percent of the lesions I would go for O18. Constantinos, what uh, is your algorithm to decide to use uh, the shock wave? You use it uh, in every patient with uh, some degree of calcium. You select the degrees of calcium. You look at the result after predilatation. You look at the IVUS. Why you choose to select uh, shock wave in some patients and not in other patients? Um, so uh, thanks, Roberto. Great question, actually. So first of all, I wouldn't use it for uh, PACS class one and two. I think it doesn't make sense because uh, there are many other treatment options and we have to keep that reimbursement is also an important uh, parameter. So uh, I, I, I go for PAX 3 and 4. Um, the second uh, criterion that I, how to select my treatment option, how is the runoff? Uh, I wouldn't risk uh, to go for a thyrectum in a patient with a single vessel runoff uh, because we know that all kinds of thyrectum procedures have a high risk for um, a distal embolization. So uh, I think that the runoff also plays a very important role. And finally, the patient. So if I have a patient with chronic kidney disease, for example, when I would like to avoid repeated angiograms uh, with a contrast agent, 
then I will go for shockwave uh, for sure. Um, how I treat the patients, I think that if I have a fibrocalcific disease uh, with an acceptable runoff and the patient that's not very high risk, I will go for atherectomy or plain old bone angioplasty, depending on the lesion. But if I have a very uh, heavily calcified disease uh, where I want to avoid complication of fragile patients, for sure I will go for shockwave. Thank you. The last question, Lorenzo. Uh, shockwave also in subintimal uh, when you are uh, unable to dilate properly the vessel due to calcification of the occluded vessels. So, I mean, it's a, it's a great uh, point, actually, because as also was said by Constantinos, there's a bit of skepticism for shockwave to be used into the, into the subintimal space. Essentially, it's, there's, there shouldn't be, you know, physically speaking, there should be no reason to suspect why the, why the, why the, the, the shockwave shouldn't work in the subintimal space. Of course, you know, the, the, the vessel, the, always the balloon needs to be sized correctly, so uh, it needs to touch the calcium. Once you crack the calcium, then you can prepare the vessel well, even to the pleura supera. We have seen like, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this, I think the synergy between uh, shockwave and supera could be great because at the moment you expand the vessel properly, you can scaffold also very well. Uh, you can, of course, uh, um, crack this calcium, which makes uh, the stand or any stand, not just supera, just being very elliptical. So I think that in the, in the um, eccentric calcium and in the subintimal space, which makes the calcium being eccentrical, uh, shockwave works as well as uh, in the normal intraluminal space. And this is my take home message. And it's not just my experience, it's just the, now the randomized control trial and uh, Andrew Olden presented this data uh, uh, very recently. It's, uh, it's just suggesting that, you know, it works in, in the in the intraluminal as with uh, with the uh, eccentric calcium. So yes, I would use in the subintima. Okay, thank you to everybody. Thank you to Asahi and um, Shockway for uh, sponsoring this session, and thank you to Jos and Jiad for organizing this uh, great congress.